Bruh, you don't even know. Today, we brought in the most resilient race car driver ever to help us brainstorm the ultimate racing machine. What's going on in the psychology of your brain when you're thinking? This is exactly what I've been missing. What? You've never been on it before? And they're just like, press down for gas and forward for brake. Dude, so you're in. When you're in, you're in. Oh, when you're in, you're in. A lot can go wrong in like a fraction of a second. Oh no, this is gonna hurt so bad. Oh, no way. <laughs> They're never gonna let me ride a motorcycle ever again. Whoa. I know I shouldn't go out for one more, but I'm gonna go anyways. So I've heard race cars, it, they go so fast that they're pushed down into the ground, like with lift, how an airplane goes up and they could stick to a ceiling. Yeah. Do you think that's true or fake? That's Rumor true. I was talking fact. with the guy that had a, uh, He's um, got injured, actually it was a C3 level injury, a little bit higher than me. And uh, he got injured in uh, IndyCar racing. And he has an IndyCar team now. And that, yeah, he was telling me that too, is they have so much downforce, it's like an upside down airplane. That's what I think they should build the track. So you just zoom and then you go up the wall. <laughs> but wouldn't it be fascinating if we watched them all on the ceiling? You know what, actually, I think Red Bull did something like that is really? um, like within an airplane or something. I think they did something with one of their Formula One cars a couple of years ago. Just to make and, it like, like show either that in a wind tunnel or something like that and showed oh. that it could do it. Dude, I just think it's so interesting. Can you explain the difference between paraplegic and quadriplegic? Because I just would love to mm. kind of make sure I'm saying the right things and understand the right way to think about injuries like this. Uh, quadriplegic is, uh, so that's technically, yeah, I'm considered a quadriplegic and um, typically what people are used to is like with Christopher Reeves with quadriplegic, they can't move any of any of his arm, but really it means just impairment in all four limbs. And that'll be with pretty close to any neck injury. So I broke my C5 vertebrae, which is, um, you have your C7 is like the ball in, the, in your back that you could feel like right at mm -hmm. the bottom in your neck. Yeah. And then you could kind of count two more above and then that's your C5. Oh, oh so it's pretty okay. high up yeah. then, right? Yeah. And the neck injuries are what gets tricky because if you yeah. like say C4 oh, I is in your back, it really is in your, yeah. Yeah. In your head kind of. Yeah. And then to kind of put it in perspective, like if I um, broke one more higher, so say for uh, C4, Ooh. then that's when you can't move your arms at all. C3 is where your breathing starts to go oh and you'd gosh. have to be on a ventilator. But then C6, you get a lot more arm strength back and seven, you have most of your hands working. So really? if you have a neck injury, oh. it's pretty much going to be considered a quadriplegic. And then a back injury is for a paraplegic. So like, say if you break anywhere from T1, which is just right under that. So it's like the very top of your rib cage, all the way down to T12 is the very bottom of your rib cage. And then your lumbar is your like L1 down to L4, which are those big bones in your, in your back. And if you break one of those bones, then you will actually 100% most likely have uh, all of your arm function. So then you'll have your full strong arms. That's like when you can see the guys kind of zip around in the chairs real easily, like real strong, right. real buff. That's uh, that's someone that's a paraplegic. So I, I, I guess I didn't realize that something between the back of the neck and like one vertebrae up could change so much below. You think it would just be like wherever the bone, like I just kind of assumed the bone was probably around your stomach or something. Yeah. So if you think about it, it's the nerves move down. Like if you remember you when you're in school and you see a diagram of a nervous system and it's like a bunch of like tree leaves breaking yeah. off. Right. Yeah. You could see, um, and if you pull up even online and like see a picture of it, yeah. you could see where the nerves stem off from. So like say from C5, it'll, mm. there'll be pretty, clear diagrams like showing like which of those nerves will um function all the way down so it's like oh. kind of where you stop the highway on your spinal cord oh okay. so i know the accident happened in 2004 you were 17 years old and this is just your senior year in high school which is a really hard time to have something like this happen but can you just walk us through the the story yeah so i was uh 17 it was beginning my senior year of high school like you said and i was going out to go ride my motorcycle out at the sandy valley motocross track just outside of las vegas we had a race there the next weekend that I wanted to go and practice for. It was, I remember like the dirt out there, it's pretty sandy and it's been raining all week. So if uh, anybody listening has have much dirt bike experience, you know that the like wet sand is the most fun to ride in. Mm. And so the track was just perfect that day. And I remember getting a ton of laps and not that many people are out there. Is it, it was, because it lets you just kind of move faster? Like yeah, you get like, a little bit of grip and then it pushes you? Like in the turns, the um, bike will kind of carve its own ruts. And then, so it's real forgiving in the corners. So then you're not like slipping on a hard uh, pack. So you can dirt. really kind of go can fast really and dig in. Yeah. Almost okay. like if you're like snow skiing in deep powder. Gotcha. Okay. okay. A and great then, day. You're out there killing it. Yeah. And uh, so then the track was starting to kind of wear down for the end of the day. 
And I remember telling my friend, I was like, oh, the track is so good right now. I know I shouldn't go out for one more, but I'm going to go anyways. Oh, no. And okay. if anybody's skied or anything else, then you know, like, you never, ever, ever mm-hmm. say one more. Yeah, like, ever. <laughs> true. Like when, you, when you know you should yeah. listen to yourself. And, and so this is afternoon, like 2 p.m., 3 p.m.? Probably like 10.30 or 11 a.m. Oh, okay. Because they usually open up the track really early. So I probably mm. got out there, like, because I remember when I was driving out there, it was dark outside. Okay. So yeah. I probably got out there at 6.30 or 7 a.m. Wow. And then um, I think they were wrapping up the big bike practice at, like, 11, and then they would roll it into, like, the mini bikes, like the little kids riding. I went out to go do uh, my last handful of laps. And then there's a jump, it's called triple jump. If you ever watched like professional races, there's like the three jumps in a row that they jump over. And this was probably about 60 or 70 foot gap. I remember when I was riding, I went around like the big bull corner in the, in front of the jump. And then I landed, uh, cause I was on my, the bikes in 125. So it's a little bit less power than like the other bikes. Right. So it's, you got to keep your momentum going. So then you're mm-hmm. trying to like get as much momentum around the outside of the corner to go and clear the jump. Mm -hmm. Uh, to get enough speed up and then i remember when i jumped i landed a little sloppy and i was like i can't end my day on that note so that so i got off of the track that wasn't the moment and then i turned around went to go do that jump again and then i got set up um on the inside of the corner so it's like typically there will be a rut on the outside and a rut on the inside and i got set up on the inside of the corner i'm like you know let me see if i could just jump this like from the inside with like less speed what I did is uh, did what we call a seat bounce. And, and jump it from the inside, what should I imagine? Like you're um, saying you're going to take the so, corner sharper? Yeah, yeah. So you take the corner a lot sharper. Okay. So it's like if you're on the, say like you're driving your car and you're going from like the third lane to the third lane, like it's a much easier long turn. Okay. You carry more speed than like the inside lane to the inside lane. Okay. Where you're going to have to like stop a lot more and then like pivot right. the car or the bike around a lot more. There's a deep rut that you could kind of lean the bike into to get a little bit more like help with it. And then I was doing, uh, trying to do what we call a seat bounce is when you sit down on, instead of like standing up as you go off the jump, like you sit back on the seat and then it'll use the shock spring to kind of like spring you up. And it'll, you'll, you can get a little bit extra height out there, if you, mm. like out of doing that if you have a uh, slower uh, speed jump. And then so I did that and then it was just, because it was a sand track, it was the end of the day, the top of the uh, jump was a little deteriorated. So there's like a little square edge lip on it. So then when I um, was in the air, the bike got kicked sideways and I was like, oh no, this is going to hurt so bad because mm. with that type sideways of Sideways like, in the air. Like kind of sideways, like, um, I think I can, like twisted like, kind yeah. of, okay. not like tipped over, almost like, like twisted. Oh, so your, your bike's kind of coming Yeah. Like, so the bike's starting towards, to go like more yeah, like whereas obviously you need the, the wheels yeah. in the right direction because otherwise you're going to flip. Yeah. And yeah. I was too tired to pull it back straight and I was done that type of a crash many a times what a dirt bike guys will call it is like a tank slapper so it's like you land crooked and then you just get like tossed left right left and you just get tossed off the bike and um i was like my shoulder is going to be done this is going to hurt so bad and i remember when i landed i um yeah i hit it and then i bounced and then i ended up kind of going head first in the ground and then i heard a big loud snap and um, now that I look back, I thought it was my helmet snapping, but I think my neck, you can definitely hear some of that too. Oh my man! And I remember la- uh, rolling down the uh, landing snap. ramp and I was like, that's so weird. This doesn't hurt. Once I stopped rolling, I just felt completely empty. And I knew like something was wrong, but I think cause your neck bone is so little that you don't really feel it break. Like from what I, all my friends that have broken their necks, like none of us have really talked about much pain. But then the guys that I know that have broken their backs, um, it's excruciating pain. So I think it just must be how the nerves are set up or something. I remember um, my breathing was real light and shallow because I couldn't uh, just get a good breath. And now as I'm learning, like with my injury, like I'll, I'll take short kind of shallow breaths because my diaphragm doesn't work all that well. Oh, the so, m- muscles weren't connected that push your lungs. Yeah, mm-hmm. so immediately everything just kind of went empty. It was the weirdest feeling that I tell people too because it's like you would think that because you can't feel it almost be like if your legs fell asleep and you couldn't feel it, but like you don't even know that you can't feel it because you can't feel them anymore oh so it was the strangest thing and also because your body is so relaxed because all that nerve connection just stopped it was like the most relaxing hot tub feeling ever oh. and probably good that i was 17 now you're almost just like a head and shoulders yeah Weird. Like your, your whole body's body as well. relaxed as it could possibly be. It was, it was the weirdest feeling. And they have a um, EMT that they always keep out at the track. 
And then so I remember the EMT came and then was asking me questions and I wasn't able to get out enough breath to talk to him. And then there was a, uh, a dad and his son that were out there that came to help me and then they wanted to take my helmet off. And I said, no, don't do that. That's, I don't think that's a good idea. They said, Did no, you, Cause you kind of knew what might've happened. Or I knew something was wrong. I remember just generally from, speaking, it's not a good idea to move someone. Yeah. Yeah. Like I remember in driver's ed when I was, probably year or so before how they always say if you see a bad accident yeah you're only 17 start. when this happened yeah yeah so all that stuff was pretty still fresh in my mind i just knew like don't move too much but then okay. he said he knew what he was doing so like he held and supported my head and my neck as he took my helmet off and everything and then the um emt and the ambulance came by the emt was just asking he's he's like hey do you feel this i said no and they're asking for me to talk to them but i couldn't really get enough of a breath out mm -hmm. so once i could finally get a little bit of something out then he's saying can you feel this i said no can you feel this I said no can you feel this and I asked that a couple of times and then he touched me like right on my chest right here and he's like can it. you feel this i was like oh my gosh that's a long ways to not feel because it was uh my mid chest down way up. yeah my type of injury that's where they call it like your level of injury so that's where I could feel and I couldn't feel it was like kind of right straight across the center of your chest. And then I remember he said, it, um, you grabbed my hands. He's like, squeeze my hands. And then I was trying to squeeze his hands, but I couldn't feel. So I didn't know if I could or I couldn't. I thought I was. And then he said, hey, squeeze my hands again. I said, am I not squeezing your hands? I said, no, you're not squeezing my hands. But you felt like you were? Yeah, because I couldn't feel my hands. So I thought I was. Mm. Oh. Because oh. I hmm. thought they still exist. Like I thought that feeling still existed. Right. Yeah. Wow. But and you were just wow. wondering when you squoze, why well, you yeah. didn't feel his fingers in your hand. Yeah, yeah, because I couldn't feel that he was holding my hand. And wow. then they took me to a um, small the airport The brain is expecting all these yeah. things and everything Yeah, because you just assume so it's quick. happening. Yeah, yeah. It's like if, yeah, I'm just asking you to grab that cup, and you're like, I'm grabbing the cup. And you like, mm -hmm. I'm like, no, I don't think you are. So it was kind of like that. I remember after that, they took us, they took me over to the, there's an airport out at Sandy Valley where they uh, brought a helicopter out to, to come and take me to UMC trauma. I remember they wanted to get my parents' phone numbers and everything to tell them what happened. Um, and me being 17, thinking I just hit my head funny or like something was going to. Oh no, you didn't want to tell yeah, them. Yeah. Yeah. So I didn't tell them my parents' them. names, phone numbers or anything. Cause I was like thinking they're never gonna let me ride a motorcycle ever again. Oh, geez, right? Cause yeah. you're still thinking. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh jeez. Somehow they ended up getting a hold of my mom's phone number and uh, called her. Um, and then I remember when they did the flight for life for me to UMC trauma. And then you're going through um, like the trauma room and everything, which was a whole crazy experience by itself. Like when you see movies or TV shows and you have like the bright lights, all the people moving around and everything, all the like steel lights coming back and forth. It's totally that. Like to, it was, I remember thinking how weird it was exactly like how the movies were. After that, they did like some tests and MRIs and whatever else they ended up doing. And then they took me and they told me that I had a uh, uh, shattered C5 vertebrae, which I didn't really know what that was. Because right. at that young, I just figured that if you broke your back, you were paralyzed. If you broke your neck, you were dead. And then somebody told me, and it must have been just like a nurse or somebody with a sense of humor that says, oh, don't worry. You'll just have a titanium plate in your neck and then you'll just beep through the airports and you'll be all good. I'm like, all right, well, that's... Not too bad. Yeah, 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 that's fine. The way you say it. Yeah. And then uh, I remember they went and took me in for surgery. I remember right before that is when I first saw my mom and I just told her, um, I was like, hey, I'm sorry because uh, mom being a mom doesn't really want their son riding motorcycles. Yeah. So uh, I remember um, trying to apologize for that. Yeah, they took me in for a surgery to um, fuse my C4, 5, and 6 vertebrae together. And then, so like right now, my next few is C4, 5, and 6. So it's funny. It's like one of the things that I noticed like almost immediately is like how you could kind of pick, like hold a phone like with your uh, yeah, like shoulder. Type. shoulder. Like I can't get my um, shoulder to my ear anymore. So just little things like that because you just lose the, uh, you lose the motion. I think with sideways, that's kind of the hit, right? Like it would have yeah, snapped sideways. Yeah, so it was sideways, sideways and then that. it kind of like ejected me off. So then I like dove right into the desert. And then you asked your mom, you said to your mom, I'm sorry, I was mm -hmm. riding the bike. Because at that point you're thinking like, I'm sorry, you had to come to the hospital and see yeah. this. So yeah, there's like, like there, it seems like you really are mistake. still thinking in the moment. But yeah. this is a, like an hour or so later, right? Yeah, this was later. probably an hour or two hours later, I'd imagine. I see. I'd say probably about two hours later. It was just fascinating the way the brain tries to digest big changes like mm -hmm. this. When something serious happens, how it seems like it's hard to just wrap your head around it quickly. You know, you keep oh, thinking. Oh, completely. 
No, and, it's it just can't be, you know. Yeah, because I remember when they put me in the helicopter, um, I had a moment that I was like, started to kind of freak out because I was like, okay, just think like happy thoughts. And me being 17 was the happy thoughts were about like a motorcycle or something like that. Mm -hmm. I'm like, wait, what if I can't do this anymore? And then I thought about it and I was like, oh no, I'm just strapped down. I can't move. So like Mm -hmm. you kind of learn to completely dissociate from the whole experience then. That's yeah. What's going on in the psychology of your brain when you're thinking, yeah, like does your body just want to like the, to stand up and your legs to move? And how did you sort of slowly over time learn to say, okay, this is just not how my life's going to be for a while? Yeah, I would say at first was, uh, yeah, it was like definitely total denial. Like at first, mm-hmm. like I remember asking the doctor when I went into a rehab hospital up, they call it Craig Hospital in Colorado up yeah. by Denver. Mm-hmm. Um, I remember asking him, hey, what are, uh, like, how long before I can start to lose my, to learn to use my fingers? And he said, well, James, most likely you're never going to be able to use your fingers. And that's when I kind of first just lost it. Yeah. Because I didn't even really think about that. I just always figured, like, the uh, heartwarming stories you see in movies of people that'll learn how to, like, start walking again or something like that. And I just figured it was like, well, if you work hard at it, you can make it work. And then it took me quite a while to learn that, like, that wasn't really the case. So I think um, a lot of it is like when I was 17, you're kind of so young and naive, you're just assuming um, that it's all going to end up getting quite a bit better. And then as I got older, it's probably about two years later is where you'd started to come to terms with, okay, this is like real life. Like I got to figure out how to get on with it. So do you still have breathing problems? Because if the, it says C3, 4, and 5, if you shatter those, you're more likely than not able to breathe. Yeah, I'm still really short on breath. So it's like, you'll notice like when I'm talking, then I'll kind of take like these like quick shallow breaths. Uh-huh. And like, I don't really have, if I sneeze, you can almost barely hear it. If I cough, cough you like, you can almost barely hear it. So um, luckily I could breathe unassisted, but I just have real um, just shallow breaths because right. I don't have all those muscles working. But when you were in the hospital, you weren't able to move your hands at all? No, and I still can't. So mm-hmm. I can move my wrist like up and down like this. But like, say if I have my hand this way, like I can't like pull it up and then I can't move my fingers at all. But like over time, your tendons get a little tighter in your fingers. So I'll use that to kind of cheat, like grabbing something. And then like, if you kind of like move, like if I move my hand up, you can see how like, even if you guys try to do it, like your hand will kind of naturally like. Oh yeah. Look at grip. I see what you mean. So, yeah, so then you I, use oh, that like to grab. Yeah. If you go like that. Yep. So like that's how I'll grab like a fork or a pen or like a water huh. bottle or something like that. Interesting. I wow. didn't even notice that at all. Yeah. Seems like you were just moving your fingers normally. Oh yeah. yeah. So cool, man. Okay. Wait, so tell me about how you kind of went from, I guess like the lowest point where you realize that this is serious and it's going to happen for a while to a point where you start at thinking, okay, like there's different opportunities in my life, but there's still things I can do and stuff I care about achieving and Kind of rebuilding think it was, kind of your sense of where you're going to be in five years. Yeah, it was probably about uh, two years into it um, was when I remember it was in my first semester going away to college up in uh, SCU in Cedar City, Utah. Is like when I had just like the real hard time of like, oh my gosh, this is like for real, this isn't changing. Um, with some of my motorcycle friends, like we've always kind of talked about like how cool it would be like to maybe make a buggy or like just figure out something that I could go drive with them. And we never quite knew what that was going to be. And then once um, this company Yamaha that started to make these rhinos, they're almost like ranch vehicles, but they're a little bit more sporty. My dad got one of those a while ago, and it was just something that we could kind of go drive around. We tried to put hand controls in it, but I was just too weak to drive it. Yeah, I was just really weak right then. And then I just didn't really understand my coordination. I barely was able to like drive my daily driver pickup truck, things like that. Right. Because I had to go get that driver's license and everything all over again. And um, that was right around the time that we were starting to think, okay, there could be something that we could start designing and playing with. There's gotta be some vehicle out there. We just don't know if that's gonna be a sand buggy. Like we don't know how that's all gonna operate. That was about when we started to play with that idea. And I'd say about 2009, 2010 is when um, we got the first uh, Pol- the Polaris, the Razor S is what they called it. And it was mm-hmm. like a little smaller two seat um, four wheel drive buggy. It was a sportier nice. version of the Rhino. And then that was like the first thing that we started to play with hand controls on. Mm-hmm. And um, the car itself was great. We put the hand controls in it, tried to do like the same setup as in my truck, but then it was really heavy to steer. So then a friend of ours that's um, really involved with a lot of off-road racing out here said, hey, maybe we could put a hydraulic uh, power steering on this. 
So then he came over and then uh, outsourced like all the parts and everything that we would need and then put a hydraulic pump on the motor and everything so then we could um, make the thing have hydraulic steering on it. Remember when I first drove that, we're all excited, we're like, this is gonna be great. And then I got in it and I could steer it a little bit better, but not that great. Okay, so help me imagine what, what's your, is it a steering wheel or what? Yeah. What's going on with what used to be the gas and brake pedal? Or how do you so drive either your truck I've or I've got it on uh, my uh, on my pickup truck. I try to keep it as standard as possible. Right. So it's easy to get in and out of um, so other people could drive it. So I have um, a lever on the left-hand side that I press down for gas and forward for brake. And then that's connected to the foot pedals. So like if like Chloe jumps in my truck, she could still go drive it. Oh, gotcha. And then um, on my steering wheel, we call it a tri pin. That's like one pin that I wrap my fingers around. And then I have one on the left and one on the right of my wrist. That then that spins around like a trucker's knob. So then I just drive with one hand on the wheel like that. Mm -hmm. and oh, okay. I've seen those. That, yeah. So it's like, okay. So it's it's it is still still a steering wheel, but instead of mm -hmm. gripping it, you're holding on to something that's yeah, kind of attached yeah, I'm to your wrist. Like this. Mm -hmm. yep. So then your entire like bicep can kind of help. Yeah. With what well, would be the wow. grip? Okay, gotcha. And then it's right up at uh, um, like twelve o'clock is where it gets a little tough because I don't have the tricep to push all the way up. So the further I get away from my body, then the weaker I am. And then uh, which that works okay on the daily driver, except for like if there's long left hand turns will get a little uh tiring and i always need to grab the wheel with the second hand You're to try like, to hold okay. myself in and yeah. that's how we originally set up the race car but it just wasn't that great for me to be able to drive aggressive yeah. so what we ended up doing is i had a friend of mine i was out at a race with and then he was watching me push my chair and he's like wait you're way stronger like down with your hands in your lap than you are reaching he's like when i watch you reach for something then you're really Right, and the wheel's Just, kind of up high. At yeah. The, at the peak, yeah. the 12 o'clock, like you're saying, is almost your chin, right? Mm -hmm. So you're better if the wheel was down here. Yeah, because I could keep it controlled versus like losing my balance as I reach mm. up. And so this then, is your first real engineering change, right? You decide yeah. the wheel goes somewhere else, I'm guessing? Yeah, and then so he said, hey, let, bring your car down to my shop. He's in California. And he's like, we'll figure something out. And then so that's when we put the wheel down almost in my lap, like a bus or like a sprint car. Um, they have these little dirt track cars that kind of drive it like a dish steering wheel, kind of like a like a bus driver or like one of those like, oh, yeah. dirt like track a lawnmower cars. wheel or yeah, something. Yeah, 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 yeah like that. Down lower. And then driver. so that's what we ended up doing is putting it right down to my lap. So then it's and we actually have it like put to the left just a little bit. So I don't have to reach as far. So like my steering wheel center is actually right here, not like center center, just because it's easier for me to steer like that. Right. At first, we did that with just like a little post coming through the seat, and then there's hydraulic pumps and everything underneath. And that was my first car that I could drive somewhat decent in like 2014. That was a hydraulic steering, but like it would always walk all over the place because there was no like mechanical connection to the um, steering rack or the steering tie rods. Right. It was just fluids. So like if you've ever driven a tractor or anything, it's um, never has a center when it comes back to. So I'd come like out of a corner to go to a jump and my hand's right here. And then like two minutes later, my hand's right here and I'm still going straight. So you're always kind of trying to follow it. And then right around that time is when we found someone that's um, done a lot of works with uh, like robotics. Mm -hmm. So we were th I was thinking, okay, I was looking at one of our um, pieces of like heavy equipment tractors at work and I was like, wait, these all work off of electronics and it's sturdy enough for like construction work in the dirt. We could probably make that work for a race car. So then I got a hold of someone that had a set of sensors that you could put like in the steering wheel. And then um, another one that'll measure like the steering shaft. And then we had it all like a steer by wire with um, a motor on the steering wheel that would turn it, which was like a game changer for um, how I was previously driving the car with the wheel walking all around. Mm -hmm. um, because then now if I put the car straight, it would go straight. And I did that for a couple of years and that started to get me a little bit more competitive. But then the problem with that is then you have no feedback into the wheel. So like I was crashing all of the time, like I'd come into a corner and end up rolling the car because oh my gosh. Feel the car like naturally start to correct, you would um, like force it to do things that it didn't want to do. And then so get the car to bind up and you get it to flip over. And yeah, so I would crash almost every race, like flip the car over. Wait, so how many time. crashes have you had since the big crash? Mm -hmm. Oh, or like the, rollovers the, the or oh yeah. too many <laughs> yeah, <laughs> i couldn't even tell you dozens for sure yeah like a dozen maybe oh 
probably two or three dozen at least, <laughs> <laughs> probably more. <laughs> yeah, so you're bit. still going out there. I think pretty I sent extreme. you a picture of uh, me totally upside down on one of them. So yeah, wow. that's, yeah. <laughs> So the other crashes were done in a buggy, but the initial initial one was done with the bike. Yeah, the one yeah. that I got paralyzed in was the bike, and then after that, it's um, this is where you the buggy's where you've designed. Is yeah. buggy mm -hmm. the right term? Polaris is what you um, call it. Yeah, we the call name? them. Uh, so they call the class like UTV or side by side. TV, side the brand side. I race right now is called Polaris. Yeah, and then that's and this will be the like in the dirt, one. right? Yeah. Like, so it's kind of like the same track, a dirt bike, kind of like dirt bikey. Will you do a jump or yeah. is it oh, a yeah, oval no. or is it a, a mixed course kind of it's thing? It's a little bit of everything. So the first races I started doing, the series is called Work Series. Yeah. And I started doing that because I could go out with my friends on their dirt bikes and then we'd race the same course. So then I would still do like the motocross jumps and everything. Like I went and rode my cars back at the motocross track I broke my neck on. And it was actually some of the most fun I've had in a car because that track's so good for the cars. Oh, really? So that was a weird feeling jumping <laughs> yeah. on the same jump that I got hurt for on. For sure. Like it's that. like you're how, yeah. talking about the uh, psychology of just yeah. like going that jump. But and, now you've conquered it, I guess, huh? Now you're not scared of it anymore? No. No, it's uh, it, it's fun out there. Take I, it on I, the I inside. Could, yeah. <laughs> the only thing is the motocross tracks don't like the cars because we move so much dirt. Yeah. Um, because you have the four tires, you have a lot of power, the tires are wider, so then it causes like a lot of... Um, uh, issues for like track maintenance mm -hmm. as far as like what i race more now is almost more like flat track like dirt track racing mm -hmm. but it's not just an oval like you have left and rights and you have quite a bit of jumps too so like there was a jump there was a track out in uh, wheatlands missouri that mm -hmm. had a jump that was like 110 feet long whoa and that one was <laughs> a it's a cool <laughs> jump if you see pictures of it because it's so big but it was a scary one too because i remember i landed yeah. kind of crossed kind of like when I broke my neck on the way that I land on that. And I bounced left, right, left down the landing ramp because oh. you're going off the takeoff as fast as the car could go. Right. Yeah, that was a nervous. So like the, the jump is 100 feet or it's like you go About 100 110 feet. feet long, you're in the air. Oh. And as tall oh, as it is, it's, <laughs> I remember it felt like you're just driving up to like a four story building because it's oh, so what? tall. <laughs> And I remember um, when I first drove on the track that you'll do like a track walk and then you so say you'll take like a slower vehicle out to like cruise around and see the track. I remember I was driving up and like, there's no way they're having us do this. I'm like, this is too big. There's <laughs> yeah, no way. for sure. Mm -hmm. so it was in a race. That's yeah. crazy. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you've never been on it before and they're just like, you do that it? That was the first time I went to that track. Yeah. And then so That's you crazy. have the, the laps are typically about a minute ish long and you have three, three lap sessions before you race. Okay. So you don't really have much time to learn the track at all. So you're trying to learn really fast. So, yeah, I guess, so elaborate, what else is different about like when you get in car accidents or the way the car is built or what kind of problems do you think are kind of uniquely uh, for your situation versus like the other drivers? Just like some perspective on all I the would kind say, of things yeah, you have to deal with that we probably don't like even the steering recognize. wheel placement, things like that. And then for me, a really important part, since I can't like hold my body straight back into the seat mm -hmm. is, um, or like push myself against my steering wheel, like when it gets real rough is like how I design my, um, seat. So I use what we call like a full containment racing seat. It's like, well, if you watch a NASCAR race and you'll see like the big aluminum shell around the driver, it hold it hugs their shoulders and everything. Yeah. So I've built one of those that we've worked with a couple different companies on and that's been a game changer for me. What's different about it? Um, it just holds you in everywhere. So it's like, it hugs your hips in really tight and then it um, hugs your uh, shoulders as well. And there's yeah. like a slot that your head moves in. So like, I mean, I've rolled the car going 60, 70 miles an hour and you don't budge. Like you're just, huh. you're in one spot the whole time. There. <laughs> and then um, the way the racing harnesses are set up, oh, like we have ours really, really tight and I have like a ratchet harness is what we call on the lap. And then that will like tighten me into the seat real well. And like when I've rolled over, I mean, you're not, you get hurt in a car if you aren't in your seat or your harness is tight because it's kind of like a hammer. Like if you push a hammer against a wall with a nail, you could barely get the nail yeah. in. But if you back it up a little bit, like an inch, and then you whack it, <laughs> then you could get it in. So Dude, it's I like- I feel so bad for your girlfriend. Just yeah. watching you like, just like rolling, like, oh, it does a couple dozen times. I've rolled over <laughs> even though I'm already injured. Like, yeah. I think she's only seen one, so. <laughs> went live yeah. yeah but is it um is it just something that gets you excited to be in those thrilling moments or what's kind of driving you to want to stay it is kind I of in an extreme extreme sport yeah i don't even know if it's a thrill and it's interesting because like most race car drivers i don't know especially like the real good ones 
are the most calm, mellow people that I know. Really? Oh, yeah. I thought they and were all just yeah, like you'd adrenaline think you'd be the junkies. Opposite. Yeah, for and sure. It's because they're so particular about like everything having to be perfect as they're driving. It's like, and then a lot of them, their other favorite yeah. sport is golf. Oh, really? No yeah. way. <laughs> I would have thought like shark harpooning yeah. or yeah. Something. something. I was like, no way. Something very active. Yeah. <laughs> so it, it, I think for people to oh. remain that calm in that type of environment, like they need to be pretty calm people. That oh, makes sense. Because right, yeah. we'll yeah. there's a lot at stake. Yeah. A lot can go wrong in like a fraction of a second. And the whole goal with the car racing, which is something that takes probably the longest to really like finally understand and let it click. And it finally, like I was finally able to understand about a year ago is to be good at it. It almost, you, need, you almost need to make it boring. Like everything's gotta be so well planned that you're barely touching the steering wheel. You're barely touching the gas and the brakes. Uh, whereas what will look like it's the fastest and the funnest is if you're sliding it in, you're kind of feeling out, you're ripping all over the place, but that's actually super slow because you're not keeping like a forward momentum. So the drivers are actually the fastest would look like they're the slowest, but it's actually not because they're yeah, kind of like mm. a tortoise and hare thing. Yeah, yeah, they're exactly. just continually hitting all the right marks. Like because they're able to carry like one or two miles an hour yeah. more than somebody else. You ever watch like those average. YouTube where they like do video games and they're like speed runs, like Mario in ten minutes or something, and then oh, they yeah. have to yeah, like they have <laughs> to like jump through everything. I feel like that's how your brain must work is you're always yeah, just like every inch you can catch up to the guy in front of you. Did you know that a Formula One car has an exhaust that gets hot enough to melt aluminum? Aluminum, that's hot. So we yeah. have on my, uh, uh, like my weekend car, it's got a turbo on it. And I have n had no idea how hot turbos get. It's either. like, if it's a little dark, it's almost red hot. And it's to the point where I've burnt all the plastics around it and everything. So aluminum will melt at 660 degrees. So if you can get hotter oh, than wow. that. And the Formula One exhaust can get to a thousand. So that's why it hey. melts. Jeez. How about this? Did you know that the manhole covers in Monaco, they have to be welded down prior to the F1 race because sometimes if a car goes right over the center of a manhole cover, it can suck it up. Manhole covers aren't light either. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it says that an F1 car at high speeds can produce huge amounts of vacuum underneath its floor. To keep wow. it stuck to the ground, they have to, you know, weld it in. Do you think that you're sucking up sand or anything at the speeds you're going? I don't think we have much arrow that comes into play at our speeds. I mean, a little bit like when you're jumping, every little bit helps. Like you get blown around by the wind and things like that. Can you get stuff out of your eye? Is that, I don't know so, anything about that, but so can, what your, I can use your hands is, go up there and get that easily? Like when I'm there? driving, so I have both both my hands, like I have my hand on the left side that's doing the gas and brake. So I press, pull ga back for gas, press forward for brake. My right hand does the steering. Mm -hmm. And what typically like the off-road race car drivers, even road drivers will do is these things called tear-offs. So if you see like on your helmet visor, cause we all have like open cockpits, so we don't have windshields on. Right. And so it's like a um, really thin layer of plastic that then the driver kind of grabs and just rips it off. And you'll stack up a race with like 30 of those things um, before you start out. And for the first couple laps when it's all muddy, you're with a lot of other cars, like they're pulling them off constantly. I um, don't, I, I can't pull my hands off the wheels and I can't grab the thing. Right. So what I've got is, or sorry, the tear off, um, we set it up. It's, there's a company that makes like a motorized roll off system is what they call it. And it's kind of like an old, like camera roll. So it's like you have a roll right here and you're right. And then the empty in the left. And then I ended up finding, uh, like a button switch that we wired in the car. That's actually meant for like eat someone's heel button for like when they talk on the radio, they'll use their heel, uh -huh. okay. which I didn't even know was a thing. I always thought everyone just did it off their fingers. Yeah. And then, so we put that button on my left side of the seat and then my radio buttons on my right side of the seat. So once I get to full throttle, then I could kind of dab it a little bit and that's how I'll wipe the mud off of my lens. Oh man. Wow. So much to it. Yeah. So I was just wondering like what your car even looks like. So it's kind of, um, if you think of a very, very off road version of a golf cart, um, it's probably about twice the size of like what a standard golf cart would be. They come standard with say 30, 32 inch tires. For my type of racing, we do smaller, about 27 inch tires. And they have about 20 inches of suspension travel. So they'll sit like the bottom of the car. Standard, they'll probably be 16 inches off the ground. With my type of racing, the lower you can get it, the better, but they have a legal height limit at eight inches. So we get it as close to eight inches as possible. <laughs> And they're about 72 and a half inches wide is I think what our legal width is. Um, length, I forget exactly how, I think like maybe 90 inches or so. 
and it doesn't have a windshield on it or like doors or anything like that. Well, actually we have like doors for protection, but it's not like doors, like car doors. Right. Um, with the other drivers, it's like a Jeep, it looks like all roll bars. Yeah, 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 like yeah, kind of like a Jeep. Bars yeah, or something like that. Yeah, so it's all roll bars with like a uh, um, aluminum roof on it, mm -hmm. and then um, you put aluminum side panels on the doors. And with most other drivers, you just jump in, so it's kind of like if you have a convertible or something that the doors sealed shut. But with mine, we can't do that. So what we did is um, we got um, permission with the uh, tech inspectors and the, and then we can uh, make like two deadbolt latches on the door so it doesn't open. So we'll have it. So my, my door will Oh, you have to be open. dead bolted in then. Yeah. And then so like then once, we'll, in, oh, once I get in, then you dead bolted in. Huh. So you're in. When you're in, you're in. Yeah, when you're in, you're in. Yeah, you're not getting out for a while. I think like on an emotional part of it, one of my coolest races, I think, was, was my first short course race okay. that I did. And um, that's like, it's the type of racing that I've kind of found my way more into lately where it's like about a mile long track. It's. Um, all within like a stadium arena. So if you've seen like a lot of my pictures and videos, most of it's been like from that type of racing. And the thing I loved about it is it reminded me of being on a motocross track. Like you have the jumps, the turns, like you have pretty fast lap times versus like a longer off-road section. And I just remember coming back from um, my first race weekend of that, my car setup was 100% wrong. Like everything was wrong, but it was my first one doing it. Had some new friends that I met out there. And I remember driving back after I got off the track, going to the truck, like waiting for everybody to get back. And I'm like, this is exactly what I've been missing oh, that's cool. for the last Man. 10, 12 So you had years. that feeling. Like yeah. The and I'm like, this is it. Like, this is exactly what I wanted. And I was Dude, I thinking, bet that nostalgia feeling is just going to oh, yeah. feel great after all you've been through. And there was like, I was remember thinking that there is no way I'm not going to be doing this. Yeah. And it changed like my whole career path and everything to be able to make sure I could like have the resources to keep doing that. So you see oh, yourself cool. still racing in 10 years? Five yeah, years? for sure. Okay. Yeah. What do you think your car might look like uh, in five, 10 years? I don't or? know. A lot of it, what I've realized now is you kind of go with the ebbs and flows of the different racing series that are available to you and like location. Like I've got some friends that say we're doing a lot more short course racing, um, but then it became such a big time commitment. And now they have like, uh, now they're married, two little kids, and they say, oh, I, can't, I can't do like that many weekends gone. So then they'll do, say, desert racing where it's maybe four weekends out of the year and then it's just a longer weekend. And whereas for the last probably 10, 12 years, like the short course racing that I do is real big on the West Coast. And um, the Lucas Oil Series um, decided to pull the plug on that about two years ago, or a year ago. And so there's not as much of that anymore. So that's really died out. So mm. I'm curious what's going to end up taking its place. Um, I'd like to get into some type of like pavement racing or something. I think. Um, Wait, what'd you say? Payment? Pavement? Pavement? Yeah, like oh, uh, you know, the asphalt, yeah, like yeah, road yeah. race, road racing. Okay. So something like that would be cool. But yeah, um, with like more than two dozen turnovers. Yeah, yeah like something yeah. where you're <laughs> staying upright more often now that I'm getting older. Completely. You know, yeah. Whatever. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, a little. Uh, <laughs> you're getting pounded a lot less by the bumps and everything. <laughs> the jumps and everything. Yeah. So I'm kind of curious about how long it takes you to just get to the racetrack, and is it hard to just find time? to race in your life? Yeah, so for me it gets tough because uh, everything is such a process. Like I can't get myself like suited up and in my car by myself. So I need to have people with me to help like lift me up, strap me in, be there in case there's an issue. Um, I used to tow the uh, trailer pretty much everywhere and now I don't do that as much anymore. I've got right. a couple guys that I race with that'll do like those types of things so I could rest and relax. Um, but yeah, I always need to have about two or three people with me every time I go take the car out. Plus, every time you take it out, you have, if nothing goes wrong, you've probably got 15 hours of prep work on it. Wow. Just to clean it, to just change like the oil, certain right. bearings that'll start wearing out. For sure. Give everything good once over because the cars, they weigh so much that they just beat themselves up a lot more than say like a dirt bike, whereas you can hose it off if you want and you could ride the thing three times a week before you really have to do mm -hmm. much maintenance so yeah so i guess going back to like the future what do you want to like add some computer systems or new materials how do you kind of imagine this car uh just evolving Ooh, I'd especially say, if you uh, had like a unlimited budget or something like what would you imagine changing the computer side of it's going to get really interesting here in the next couple of years because um, like the way that I do my power steering is it's um, an electric motor. It's real strong. It puts out like 80 foot pounds of torque. Say like when you see those guys like pull lug nuts off of a car with an impact drill, it's about that strong. 
and it's cool like the the thing with mine is um i was able to customize everything so you do everything on an excel csv file and you put in the grid if uh, it feels this amount of input it's going to do this amount of output so you have 64 points along the way that you can adjust your input and output so so like i have five different torque curves on my steering so like driving around the pits really torque slow curves is, yeah with the torque you know what that is I'm the tor- yeah, I was, I was like, I'm sorry. It's like, yeah, we're torque curve. Yeah. So, it's, <laughs> so it's like how, yeah. how it uh, ramps up. Like if you're looking at like, a line graph of like you're putting in one pound of effort, then it's going to equal this amount of pounds oh, of output. Oh, like, yeah. Okay, gotcha. Input, output, graph. Like yeah. you're actually saying if you were to map this. Yeah, and it's fully mapped out. So like I'll have a couple different maps going. I have, say like if it's a drier track, I'll put it on map four where it needs to be a little bit stronger. If it's a wetter oh, track, maybe cool. I'll do it on three where it can be a little weaker because it's going to scrub. So it's not going to be as hard to drive. Wait, so what or, metrics do you graph? Torque is one and obviously speed yeah, and it's, uh, velocity. Your steering wheel input of like however many bits it is, which I don't know how they calculate that. I think it must be off of like foot pounds of torque of input okay. to uh, foot pounds of torque of output. And then which they'll do in like, I think what, yeah, they'll do it in like how, I don't know how many amps you're going to put out. So if you're going to give it, say like, one foot pound of torque from your hand, it'll kick out say 10 amps for the motor. Right. And the more you want it more sensitive probably, right? Yeah. So I try to do mine as sensitive as I can. Mm -hmm. And then now that the technology is so good, I've discovered there is too sensitive because it makes it too touchy. And then, so I've backed it down a little bit to give like a little better curve to it. And um, that's I tried, helped I tried out that with a lot. My, my mouse. I was like, well, "Dude, such a waste for me to like move my mouse over here. Yeah. I'll just make it super sensitive." Mm-hmm. And I was just like, "Oh, I cannot." <laughs> yeah, and almost. Like, I would move it, it just yeah. the tiniest bit. And at first, I was like, "Just give it time, Dylan. You're gonna be so efficient." And it was just <laughs> terrible, and I totally had to go. Yeah, back. and you're trying to like click the little box, like you keep missing it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah it's exactly like that. Oh, hit, click the thing. Yeah. Say like you have a sandpaper grittery, like gritty mouse pad versus a smooth one. You'd probably have two different settings. Right. Yeah. For sure like your DPI changes and all that stuff. Along the lines of like with the spinal cord injury, what are the things that most people don't really think about? Um, Low blood pressure is a big issue. You always get like real dizzy because you don't have the leg muscles and like the ab muscles tight to like hold all your blood up in your head. So you get real lightheaded real easily. And especially with the race, because they're usually in the late afternoon, early evening. So you're kind of tired from the day. Right. So like I always try to keep my race car seat leaned back as much as I can, just just because it's, I'll get less dizzy in the seat. But like how fighter pilots will have like those suits where they make stop themselves from passing out. Something like, say in the car, if you had a suit on that would like fill up with air or water or something to keep your body tight, that'd be pretty cool. Do you practice like G-Force training in like one of those simulators or anything? I never have, but that'd be kind of cool to go check out. Yeah, why not? Just give yourself an advantage. I wear these uh, compression socks. Yeah. So it'd be maybe something like that. Yeah, something kind of like that. That'd be kind of cool. With that, if you hold your breath, do you get dizzy? Yeah, I try not. I actually, I haven't really held my breath all that long for quite a while. But mm. yeah, I'll get pretty dizzy if I hold my breath for too long. How high up the ground have you been? Um, I've easily been like as tall as the ceiling. <gasps> so wow. easily like 10, 12 <laughs> feet up. Um, maybe even higher if you kind of factor in like what the downside is. How loud's the engine one through 10? Is it like a real it's loud. grizzly sound? Yeah, yeah. It's, it, so you could be 10 loud. feet off the ground, 90 miles an hour and mm-hmm. a roaring engine in your face. And yeah. And you're saying only the calm people like this sport? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right. <laughs> or maybe they're not as calm as they lead on to be. Yeah. yeah. Like with our racing, you get so close together. I mean, you're within inches of each other a lot of the time and you're on the dirt and the mud. So you're a like spinning all over the place. And I remember um, there was a guy probably about two years ago, we were racing each other. We were going back and forth and back and forth. And he pulled pretty dirty move actually. And kind of caught off into me. Oh, geez. And then, so then we. Bad move with James. Yeah. (laughs) So, and then since we have open wheel cars, you can't really like bump into each other because you don't know if it's going to be you or them going. It's total luck of the draw. So you can't really. like really hit someone, the old yeah. NASCAR movies where you could like put someone in a wall because like you could try to do that, but then you'll be the one that's like breaking your wheel off. Right. So you don't know if it's going to be you or <laughs> yeah. them. And so like he kind of came into me a couple times and then I finally got around him on one of the last corners. And then um, he tried to cut too far into me, but then like drove up on my rear tire and then it spun around and flipped him. Oh, and then, really? so luckily I was able to get out of that one clean. That's karma right there. Do you have a trophy like 
like bookshelf or something at home? I don't because I've never won like a first through third place trophy yet. Um, I you have almost, a place where you're going to put them? I do. <laughs> yeah, we have a shelf of where we're going to put them in the shop. I've passed the guy for third place in a race once and on, they put out the white flag lap for the last lap and then so I only had maybe 45 seconds left of the race and then my motor blew. Oh, wow. So, oh, darn. That was like there. This right yeah, then, right there. Like, that was the biggest the bummer. Mm -hmm. It just happens sometimes. Do motors blow ever? Yeah. So Seriously. in our racing, because you have such a high RPM for so long, yeah. they'll end up going. And then what we've learned is because um, the majority of the turns are left hands on the track. Yeah. And the, the place that like the oil cooler and everything is set up is uh, it'll like suck all of the oil to the right of the car since you're turning less mostly. Yeah. And then it'll starve it of oil. So you need to... Um, like reconfigure the routing and everything of it so it'll keep cycling oil in. So I had about a year and a half where we kept going through motors every couple of races and then we found out it was the way the oil was being siphoned in. Wow. wow. Give us some jargon. What is the jargon? Like what should we know if Sari and I show up and we want to like just fit in? Um, for the car setup, the toe in and toe out is always real important. You know what that is? How it's, <laughs> toe in, toe out? It's uh, if you think about like pigeon toed or like outside like so so the way that you do your front tires is like however many quarter inches of like toe in that you have oh, okay. so say you'll do it like so dead someone's even. saying like very pigeon toed toe in yeah means they think their car is going to be more sharp yeah so like typically what i'll do is i'll try to like have my, both of my wheels pushed in like the front of the wheels um either between a quarter or an eighth inch more in than the back and then it makes the car track a lot straighter because if you have like both your wheels just track dead straight. Track a lot straight, straighter? Do you know what that means? So like as you're <laughs> driving, um, like down a straightaway, it won't wander on you. Oh, oh, gotcha. Whereas like if you have it dead straight, it'll wander on you so a little like, bit. If you let go of the wheel, it's gonna basically Yeah, the wheel, yeah, it'll straight. start like shaking, like if you're driving your car down the road, yeah. like it'll start kind of wiggling a little bit. But then it makes the car a little difficult to turn. So what, um, someone that could manage um, like the unpredictability on those fast straightaways, I'll actually try to tow the car out just a little bit. So it's um, kind of like your feet. Like, be all shaky, yeah. but they'll just be like, I got this. Like, yeah, so, the, so like if they could manage that, what happens is then when you're in the corner, so it's like it, your front of your car is like pointed out a little further than like the, or sorry, the front of the, your front tires is pointed out about an eighth to a quarter inch more than the uh, rear. Yeah. So it's kind of like a wedge, like a V. Yeah. But then what happens is like when you go and turn your steering wheel and the car kind of sets down in a corner, then that inside corner is already steering a little bit more for you. So then it oh, gets a gotcha. much better turn, but it's a lot more unpredictable to drive in the straights. Mm -hmm. oh. Interesting. That's good. What else? What are other little things we should know? Tire pressures and tire grooving are always a really big thing. You know anything about that? Tire pressure. Yeah, uh, it's a tire tire pressure. Yeah. Tire pressure is kind of <laughs> yeah, it's um the lower your pressure is, the more traction you get, but then it's kind of the car will get more squishy and it'll feel like it'll roll off of the bead of the wheel. Okay. So um like in my racing to keep the weight down, we don't use what we call bead locks that have like say thirty bolts on the edge of the wheel to hold the tire in. Oh okay. so I need to run a higher pressure, um, and then we do it for like less rolling resistance too. So the car will roll straighter, kinda of like a bike tire, like if you have it at 60 PSI versus 20, it's gonna be a lot easier to ride, but then it's gonna be less grippy. And then um, the grooving for us is a really big thing. So we have like this the hot- tire grooves? Yeah, so this hot iron that we have, so you buy your tires. And then oh, the you make your own grooves? Yeah, and then you, you cut, and then you cut up the tires, yeah. Huh. So it's like a hot That's razor. So, cool. so you make your own little design on the yeah. little wheels? Oh. What design did you oh, choose? Cool. Or like, are you thinking about like how the sand gets it, in there? It all depends or? on um, what you're anticipating the track to be like. Like if it's going to be really muddy, then you um, get rid of a lot of the surface area or contact patch on the rubber to kind of give more knobs into the tire and let it clean itself out. So like you'll have it like more straight lines or like a V so it'll clean the mud up. If it's going to be a drier track, you want to have as much rubber on the ground because what happens is they call it blue groove towards the end of the race which is you'll actually see like dark purple lines in the dirt where all the tires leave the rubber down because the dirt gets so hard packed. Huh. And then the dirt will actually get hot too. So it's kind of like pavement. So then you want your tire to stick as much to that as you can. So you want to leave as much rubber on if you know it's going to be like a dry hard packed track, but if it's going to be wet, you want to have the tire be able to dig in and clean the rubber out of itself. That's crazy. So is it like branding a cattle or something? Or are you just like- Yeah, kind of. It's thing? like a- uh, like a hot glue gun, soldering iron type of thing, but like real big and industrial. And then it has um, 
tons of different little razor blades that are all like different gauges, different it's shapes, like a V or like a U. And then um, you heat it up and you just cut right through. I would just be putting like flowers and cool, yeah. like pirate, pirate <laughs> yeah. logos yeah. and stuff on mine. <laughs> what about that sound um, when they put the bolts on a car? Do you like that thing? The, 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 the impact the, guns? The, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I love that sound. Yeah. Great. What about the smell of gas into it? I like it. And uh, me too. The, the like best gas is uh, yeah. oil, uh, the, the old two stroke engines, like on the dirt bikes, when you'd pre mix the gas and the oil. Yeah. That smells the best. And then on our car, we run a uh, race gas. So we have a spec fuel we need to run. Oh, was that like smell a 96 like? octane? It smells great. Crazy. It's, <laughs> it's uh, strong and it's like bright blue. Wow. Oh. So it's like, it uh, looks like mouthwash almost. What about ASMR? <laughs> Are you into it? Like engine sounds? Um, I like engine sounds, but like, uh, you're talking like ASMR, like the breathing and like, the or like, or yeah, like but that. it would just be like, yeah. you, would you just maybe fall asleep too? Like, oh, I would totally do the like engine a revving sounds. Engine, yeah. Like, I feel <laughs> yeah. like oh, it just helps me like get in the zone. That's actually a good idea. I need to yeah. see the engine <laughs> that's available. Next time, yeah. Until yeah. she's like, hey, turn off that engine sound. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just having trouble sleeping. Like yeah. put in the AirPods at least. Yeah. Do you have an inspirational story where somebody's come to you and said, Hey, like I saw you out there and. I have an injury and you made me that's believe That's something and... that's really cool, especially with the racing that I do now with the short course racing. And when Lucas Oil is ahead of the series, there's much more of a TV package and everything going. But um, at all of those races, like the pit presence is a big deal. Um, it used to draw out a ton of fans. So you'd have, you're like, you're racing in front of like a full crowd of like full stadium seats. And then there's one in Crandon, Wisconsin that we go do. Uh, we did it for our first time last year and they've been doing the same race for about 50 years and it's a small little town and there's about 60,000 people that it draws out wow. and so they're all watching and it's a huge race and then um, the coolest part is like you have people that come up and say hey my brother-in-law was in an injury a couple of years ago mm -hmm. uh, we just want to get something like that he could drive around the farm like do you have any ideas of how that could help so I'd say every time I'm out at a race, there's some type of a story like that, yeah, someone that I yeah. chat with, and it's cool to just kind of see the light bulb go off. Yeah, that's of a good point, because as much them as wanting to do it. there's people with injuries that maybe want to be like extreme race car drivers, there's probably a ton of people who just need help with like their, their lawnmower or their regular yeah, car, and, and they're looking at you thinking, wow, if I could just get around better. Yeah, that's what's interesting, is I kind of figured most people would want to be doing like what I'm doing. And uh, there's a couple that I know that do, um, but a lot of, um, like with a motorcycle racer has kind of gone both ways. It's like, they're either, uh, want to get right back to it or they're kind of been there, done that. And they just want something to kind of go cruise around, like take their kids up in the mountains, things like that. Yeah. Cool. Well, you're an inspiration. So thank you for spending some time with us. Um, we really appreciate it. And yeah, it was just a pleasure getting to know you and having you share all those stories. So thank you. Thank oh, you. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Awesome. Oh, thank you. That was great. Yeah.